During the 1960s, the Soviet aviation industry conducted a number of projects to develop fast attack strike jets that would be capable of carrying large payloads at high speeds and performing low-level attacks. The impossibility of getting all of these requirements met by a single design at the time resulted in half a dozen different aircraft either entering service or at least advancing into prototype testing. The initial prototype of what eventually became the Su-24 was the T-6-1, which flew in 1967. It used a combination of lift jets in the forward fuselage with a delta wing and a conventional tail. This proved to be a massive failure, and Sukhoi went back to the drawing board. The design was reworked to use variable geometry wings instead of lift jets to increase takeoff and landing performance, and it benefited from advances in electronics. This new plane, the T-6-2, flew in 1970. The jet showed potential and was pretty close to meeting its performance goals, but some of the electronics had major issues. In particular, the all-new fully integrated TACNAV system, which was the first of its kind in the Soviet Union. It took almost five years and the lives of 13 test pilots to rework the T-62 into an operational plane, but it finally entered service in 1975 as the Su-24. It was codenamed Fencer by NATO and quickly started replacing obsolete strike jets from the 1950s. During state trials and war game exercises, the Su-24 demonstrated flight performance that was well ahead of any other ground attack aircraft in the Soviet inventory, and pilots reported disbelief at the accuracy of its weapon system compared to older designs. The plane had its first combat operations during the Soviet war in Afghanistan, and it was regarded as highly effective, with no operational losses, despite conducting sorties that were considered extremely high risk. The Su-24M upgrade program started even before the early model fully entered service. It had an in-flight refueling probe, upgrades to the combat computer and targeting systems, and a slightly redesigned forward fuselage. The Su-24M started entering service in 1983, and it still flies today. What we get in War Thunder is the Su-24M, a strike aircraft in rank 7 of the Soviet tech tree at battle rating 11.3. This jet, unsurprisingly, has a fully featured ballistics computer and a built-in optical targeting system with a laser designator, but no thermal imaging. It gets the SPO-15S radar warning receiver, which is a sensor-based unit that tracks G through I-bands with fairly good range. It also includes a missile approach warning system, but as of making this review, the MOS is really flaky, and it often misidentifies other aircraft, flares, and even your own bombs as being incoming missiles. So I strongly suggest turning off the automatic countermeasure slaving. The radar set is the Orion Search Radar. This is a K-band radar set that has only a fixed ground-moving target indicator mode, and it detects moving targets on the ground. It can't see stationary targets, it can't lock, and it has no functionality at all against air targets. But it is potentially useful if you need to figure out where to look for targets in the absence of scouting or in simulator battles. The loadouts on this plane include one of the widest selections of air-to-ground weapons of anything in the game at this point along with dogfight missiles, dumb bombs, rocket pods, some crazy gun pods, and drop tanks. The air-to-air -air missile is the R-60M. By now, you're familiar with this from going up the Soviet tech tree, and it's the same all-aspect missile with pretty good short-range performance, but it still loves to chase flares. You can get kills with it, but you just have to take pretty careful shots. The guided air-to-ground ordnance choices are pretty wide. For laser-guided weapons, you can take a couple of different sizes of bombs. No inertial tracking, but these are fairly accurate anyway, as long as you can keep the target lazed. You can also take three varieties of laser-guided missiles, depending on if you prefer more smaller weapons or fewer big weapons. The KH-25ML stands out as being very fast, while the KH-29L has a more powerful warhead. T-6-2 
TV-guided weapons include two varieties of bombs as well as the KH-29TE. The 29TE is one of my favorite air-to-ground missiles in the entire game, as it combines good speed and a heavy punch, along with fire-and-forget capability. New to this update is the CAB 500S GLONASS satellite-guided bombs. These are incredibly accurate, are drop-and-forget, and don't even need to be able to see the target. However, they attack fixed points on the ground, and they don't track moving targets, so situational weapons. But you can take a lot of them, which kind of makes up for the reduced utility. Plus, if you really hate yourself, you can try using the KH-23M manual command line of sight missiles up at the top tier. But don't. Lastly, this plane carries the GSH-623 cannon, and it can take three more of them as external gun pods. As of making this review, the gun pods do not have any target tracking functionality, but they still have an absolutely insane cyclic rate of 9,000 rounds per minute per gun. If you can hit anything in air combat with these, it's just removed from existence but the ground belts do still have trouble with thicker targets. In terms of its flight performance, it's important to remember something. The Su-24 is a supersonic bomber, not a fighter, and not a fighter bomber. The engine power is adequate, and the jet doesn't really feel underpowered, but it's still a very large and heavy aircraft. The rate of climb is average, but the acceleration isn't very good, and its top-end speed at low level ends up being just a bit over Mach 1 with external weapons loaded. The agility for dogfighting or repositioning is quite poor, which should be expected from this kind of aircraft. If you end up in a conventional dogfight against a conventional fighter, it's usually going to end badly, unless the opponent makes serious errors in their basic ACM. The one trick this jet has is to throw the air brakes out, unsweep the wings, and cut the throttle to try and force an overshoot. But that only works once, since you'll be in a very low energy state, and the opponent won't, so they can just swing back around on you without much hassle. Still, it might give you a quick two-second window to try with an R60 if you're desperate. Like other variable geometry aircraft, you can use the manual wing sweep to try to get a slight boost to turning performance at medium speeds with fully unswept wings, but I just want to caution you that it's only going to be a very small help with this plane. The overall wing area on the Su-24 is pretty small relative to its weight, so even in an optimal configuration, you're still going to get dunked on by single-engine fighters. Expect it. Taking this jet out in air battles is fairly standard high-tier bomber stuff, but with a few caveats. The acceleration is pretty bad at low speeds, so other jets early in the match aren't going to have any trouble beating you to the targets. Between the popularity of other strike aircraft, and the number of premium fighter jets taking bomb loads in this BR range, actually being able to do base bombing is going to be the exception with the Su-24 rather than the norm. You'll have much better success in air battles going for AI ground units, but if you do get the chance to hit bases, the heavy bomb load can take out several of them in one sortie depending on what you fly out with. If you must use this for air combat, your best bet will be to take the gun pods and the R60s and fly it out like an F-104 or a tornado and just hope for the best. Flying up as close air support is more of this plane's native habitat, and it can be very effective. The good news is that, since it's in the Soviet tree, you rarely get clubbed out by a Pantsir S-1 five seconds after spawning in. But the bad news is that more conventional SPAA units are still pretty effective up at this tier once you get within practical engagement range for the Su-24's weapons. My personal preference for close air support is usually to take a smaller quantity of higher impact weapons. It's personal playstyle, and some folks prefer to take more shots, even if the individual hits are a little smaller, and that's fine. But I like to try and maximize my chances of a one-hit kill on an individual shot whenever possible. 
With the Su-24M, I had the best luck using the KH-29TE TV-guided missiles, using them at about medium range. As always at higher tiers right now, though, your effectiveness with TV or laser weapons is going to be heavily dependent on cloud cover, and the new GLONASS bombs can provide an option if you get stuck in an overcast match or something like that. Just remember, they don't track moving targets, but you can safely throw them out at scout arrows from above the clouds and just kind of hope to get lucky. Visually, this is a weird one. From some angles, it looks really boxy, and in my opinion, the wings just look tiny relative to the size of the rest of the plane. You get three paint jobs for it, and my personal choice is the desert camo, although I have to say the Algerian one is pretty unique, and it really stands out. Landing the Su-24 is fairly straightforward, as long as you remember it's a heavy jet, and even with the wings unswept, a low-altitude stall is usually fatal. You can safely drop gear at about 500 kilometers an hour, and it gets a drag chute. The cockpit on this plane is... A big reminder that this is a bomber and not a fighter. The visibility is awful, and the co-pilot blocks half the sky. The flight instruments are easy to read, but that's the best I can say. Not a great experience out in VR. To close out on the Su-24M. This jet carries an enormous selection of air-to-ground guided weapons. The cannons are insane, and it gets ground tracking radar. However, no thermals, it kind of flies like an oil tanker, and the Maws is flaky. The final verdict on the Su-24M is that this plane can potentially dominate the battlefield in a close air support role, but out in air battles, it's gonna feel like a struggle bus most of the time, and you'll usually only get to attack the leftovers. As always, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, check out this other one.